Hi everyone, it's Nini. I'm reviewing Matthew Perry's book, Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing. Matthew battled addiction his entire life and lost his battle in October 2023 at the age of 54. He said, when I die, I want helping others to be the first thing that's mentioned. Addiction is far too powerful for anyone to defeat alone, but together, one day at a time, we can beat it down. My goal is to help honor Matthew's desire to help others. I hope this helps another addict out there not feel so alone or help someone who has a loved one dealing with addiction have more insight into the disease. In chapter 10, Matthew goes back to the time he was filming the movie Serving Sarah in Dallas. He writes, Imagine this. You have to walk back onto a set where you have almost literally shat the bed for weeks before. You've been out of it, slurring lines, making bad decisions. Even though you have not one, but two sober companions, you call room service at the hotel, your voice shaking, detoxing, and say, please put a bottle of vodka in the bathroom of my room. Yes, the bathtub. Hide it in there. And then when the day is done, you head back to that fucking hotel room, and you drink the bottle of vodka, and you finally feel all right again for maybe three hours, and then have to do it all over again the next day. You're shaking, pretending that you are not in very serious trouble whenever you talk to anyone. Using that same shaky voice, you call the hotel and tell them to do the vodka bottle in the bathtub thing again. This is perhaps something that a normie, what we addicts call all you lucky non-alcoholics, might always struggle to understand. I'll take a stab at explaining it. When you drink an entire bottle of vodka, you are extremely sick the following day. Having a few drinks in the morning helps, but I was the lead in a giant studio movie, so I could not drink in the morning. You are sick and trembling, and it feels like every part of your insides is trying to squeeze out of your body. I know exactly what that feels like because I discovered, if that's the word to use, vodka after my father died because I had been drinking to cope with that. And I had been drinking Mike's Hard Lemonade. And there was another carbonated beverage, but I don't remember the name of it. But you had to drink a bunch of them in order to get to the level of drunk that I wanted to be where the pain of losing my father didn't hurt as much. I don't know what led me to get vodka, but I realized, oh my gosh, I can drink just a little bit of it and it packs the same punch as drinking like four carbonated beverages. And so vodka was what I turned to. And holy crap, does it ever make you feel like shit. I called in work a lot due to hangovers and came dangerously close to being written up for missing so many days of work. And some days I would have the thought, my gosh, I'm tired of feeling physically like crap. I can't do this anymore. But then five hours later, I would drink vodka again. Vodka was also the first time in my life I had blackouts from alcohol. I had two blackouts for sure that I knew of. And if I ever get around to doing a video on my addiction story, I'll go into more detail about those because those are scary. You know, to wake up the next morning and see evidence of you doing something around the house and you have no memory of doing it at all. That is scary, but it doesn't make you stop drinking. Back to Matthew's book, he writes that his behavior on the set of Serving Sarah was horrible. But he was one of the most famous people in the world at the time thanks to friends, so no one confronted him about it. He would pass out in his chair, he'd stumble through scenes. They paused the movie, he went to rehab, and then they came back to finish filming. Matthew apologized to everyone, but he knew they were pissed. He also had to re-record his audio from when he had been slurring. He writes that his addiction was his best friend and his evil friend, his punisher and lover, his big terrible thing. But he realized he was there for more than the big terrible thing. He could help people and love them because of how far down the scale he had went. He had a story to tell, a story that could really help people, and helping others had become the answer for him. He then goes to July 19th, 2019, when he woke up from the coma after his colon exploded. When he found out he had a temporary colostomy bag, he thought, that's great, girls find that to be a definite turn on. <laughs> he had been inches from death, he was attached to 50 machines. He had to relearn how to walk. Matthew had to be in the hospital for five months. And he had done all of this to himself. He felt shame and regret. He was grateful this happened before COVID. Otherwise, his friends and family wouldn't have been able to visit him for those five months. But he writes that even if that had happened, he wouldn't have been alone in the room. There was God's love. This was one of my favorite parts of this book, in the beginning of his life, he maybe didn't turn to God that much and just, you know, said a prayer here and there. But throughout his journey, he discovered God's love. He discovered that God was always with him. I think that's a very beautiful part of this book. Matthew's mother spent a lot of time in the hospital with him, and Matthew writes he needed to be grateful to her instead of mad at her. 
Because had she not been his mother, he wouldn't have been the person he was and therefore influenced the character of Chandler. And he realized he had abandoned his mother when he was 15 to go live with his dad, which is what his dad had done to her when Matthew was a baby. She had done her best and he was grateful for that. And this is such an important thing. He writes, if you're going to blame your parents for the bad stuff, you have to give them credit for the good stuff. His off and on chronic opioid use had caused his colon to rupture. Opioids can cause constipation. Matthew writes it was kind of poetic. He was so full of shit, it almost killed him. Ironically, as he recovered, he was in literal pain and he asked for opioids and they gave them to him. But eventually the pain subsided, but he pretended to be in pain to continue to get opioids. His colostomy bag broke at least 50 times. He writes, Dear colostomy bag people, make a bag that doesn't break, you f***ing morons. Did I make you laugh on friends? If so, don't put shit all over my face. (laughs) Matthew writes about tolerance and how when you want to feel euphoric, you have to take more and more pills to achieve that. So the pills he was being prescribed for his stomach pain were not enough. So he tried to get more from a dealer. But he had a sober companion and his assistant living with him. He tried four times and got caught four times. He went back to rehab in New York. He said one of the nurses was very attractive and he flirted with her, but she didn't flirt back. But he notes it was probably because she was the one changing his colostomy bag and had seen him covered in his own shit multiple times. (laughs) He says there aren't enough opioids in the world to get him high anymore. And he had successfully quit drinking because after 14 glasses of vodka, he wasn't getting drunk. He writes, it's time to figure something else out. I am this close to dying every day. I don't have another sobriety in me. I would have to go out hard because my tolerance is so high. He writes about a character in Dope Sick who dies from heroin. You see her smile and die. He writes, that smile is the feeling he wants all the time. She must have felt so good, but it killed her. That blissful moment is what Matthew sought, only without the death part. I want that connection to something bigger than me because it's the only thing that will truly save me. I don't want to die. I'm scared to die. God, those are sad words to read in hindsight. Matthew said he would give up all the fame and money to not have this addiction, to not have a brain that was built to kill him. He says he not only has the disease, but he has it as bad as you can have it. He writes, it's going to kill me. I guess something has to. And that again is so sad to read because it did kill him. He says alcoholics and addicts want to drink for the sole purpose of feeling better. He writes all he ever wanted to do was feel better. Nobody has a drinking problem and then stops and then drinks socially and it's fine. The disease just picks up. And that is something that I have learned. I cannot be a social drinker. I just can't. Because you open that door just a little bit and then before you know it, it's wide open. He writes addiction is patient, waiting for you to slip back into its grip, waiting for you to start to skip going to meetings. He writes that addicts are not bad people. We're just people who are trying to feel better. But we have this disease. He says, when I feel bad, I think, give me something that makes me feel better. He admits that he would still love to drink and take drugs, but he's so late stage that it would kill him. He says, scars are interesting. They tell an honest story and they are proof that a battle was fought and hard won. I once saw Martin Sheen at at a podium and he said, uh, I want to tell you a story about a guy who goes to St. Peter's office. He dies and he goes to St. Peter's office and St. Peter says... Do you have any scars? And the man very proudly says, no, I don't. And St. Peter says, why? Was there nothing worth fighting for? And I liked hearing that. He feels like he has grown up. He no longer feels like he needs to leave a room screaming in laughter. He just has to stand up straight and leave. And hopefully not walk directly into the closet. He's calmer and more genuine, more capable. He writes, I am me, and that should be enough. It always has been enough. Chapter 11 and the final chapter in the book is titled Batman. Matthew says he never imagined he would be 52 years old and single and not have a beautiful wife and cute kids. He says, though, that if you spend too much time looking in the rearview mirror, you'll crash your car. But he still longs for a romantic companion, a teammate. He finds himself filled with peace and gratitude and a deeper understanding of everything he's been through. He had quit smoking, and Matthew had been a very heavy smoker, so bad that he actually ended up with emphysema due to his smoking. But now he felt brighter and fresher. He was no longer mired in the impossible battle of drugs and alcohol. 
Those are more words that are hard to read. From my understanding, Matthew was able to maintain sobriety from opioids and alcohol, but since he died from a ketamine overdose that had not been administered by a doctor, it seems Matthew was still trying to find ways to feel better and escape demons, and that breaks my heart for him. Matthew reflected on his life, his relationship with his mother. Keith Morrison, Matthew's stepdad, told him when he and Matthew's mom first started dating, she had told Keith that Matthew would always be the most important person in her life, and Keith would have to accept that, which I think was important for Matthew to hear because in an earlier chapter, he talked about being five or six years old and wanting his mother to look at him, and she wouldn't. But he does write that he did always feel his mother's love, even in their darkest moments. And I think that's something that's so powerful about love is that it's there. Like even if it gets buried under a rug of a bunch of difficult emotions and things that are hard to wrap our mind around, the love is still there. Matthew thought about his dad and brothers and sisters and how none of them turned their backs on him. He thought about his friends and particularly the Murray brothers who created with him a funny way of talking that touched the hearts of millions how the laughter of his friends was at times the only drug he needed. He thought about the cast of friends and the intense friendship they shared. He can still hear the echoes of laughter from the fans who watched Friends. All the sponsors and sober companions who had helped him over the years, the medical staff at UCLA who saved his life, even though he's not allowed to go back there because he got caught smoking. Matthew thought about how lucky he was to be in a business that allowed him access to extraordinary people, but also allowed him to affect people in a profound way. He thought, maybe I'm not so bad after all. Matthew felt gratitude for everything he learned in his life, for the scars on his stomach that proved he had a life worth fighting for, for being able to help a fellow man with his struggle. He was grateful for all the beautiful women he had had in his life over the years. He writes he is sorry he broke up with them simply because he was afraid. And he adds, oh, and I'm available. (laughs) He doesn't move forward with fear anymore, but with curiosity. He has known hell and wants no part of it, but knows he has the courage to face it. He writes, who am I going to be? Whoever it is, I will take it on as a man who has finally acquired the taste for life. I fought that taste, man. I fought it hard. But in the end, admitting defeat was winning. Addiction, the big terrible thing, is far too powerful for anyone to defeat alone. But together, one day at a time, we can beat it down. He ends the book by saying you might be called upon to do something important, so be ready for it. And when whatever happens, just think, what would Batman do? And do that. Matthew had a big interest in Batman. When you look at his Instagram, he's got a lot of Batman-related posts in there. And he also referred to himself as Matman. I think that also goes back to something he mentioned in an earlier chapter, where when he was little, he looked at his dad as a superhero, and he had said to his dad, you be Superman and I'll be Batman. In Matthew's final Instagram post, it was of him in his hot tub, which I think might be the hot tub he had been found in when he passed away. And he captioned it, oh, so warm water swirling around makes you feel good? I'm Matman. I think Matthew, wherever he is at this moment, finally feels good and he's no longer battling those demons that haunted him his entire life. When I went to treatment, I did outpatient treatment and they had a bookcase in there with a bunch of books that you were free to take. But most of them were just the big book, AA, and then the other versions like an NA book and other books all related on sobriety. But I think every treatment center who's going to give out books like that needs to have a bunch of copies of this book to give out to people. It was so good. It was so moving. You could feel his pain. You could also feel the joyful parts in his life. I just, I loved reading it. I hope you guys enjoyed this series. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye. I would like to be remembered as somebody who... uh lived well, loved well, was a seeker. And his paramount thing is that he wants to help people. That's, that's what I want.